Hi, friends. Susan Blackwell from The Spark File here to let you know that the doors are open for The Spark File Illum, a nine-month group creativity coaching mastermind that invites you to be the chief creative officer and chief marketing officer of your creativity. But what does that mean? That means in nine months in Illum, you will clarify and advance your big creative goals and learn how to effectively share your work with the world. Now, if you're listening to this and you're an experienced creative or an accomplished professional who seeks a space where it is safe to attempt something you've never tried before or complete a big creative project or take your work to the next level and acquire the skills needed to share your creative work with the world, Illum might be right for you. We are calling in emotionally intelligent, high-functioning creatives who are ready to level up. You can find out more by going to thesparkfile.com slash Illum, but do it now to find out if Illum is right for you and to save with early bird discounts. That's thesparkfile.com slash Illum. Take a leap, take a risk. Go to thesparkfile.com slash Illum and join us for Illum. The Sparkfile podcast may contain profanity and other adult content. Please use your discretion. When I bump into something that inspires me, I dump it in my Sparkfile. To be something that I want to make or how I want to be. I pump it in my Sparkfile. I jump into my Sparkfile. Welcome to the Spark File, where we believe that everyone is creative, but smart, creative people don't go it alone. I'm Laura Camion. And I'm Susan Blackwell, and we are creativity coaches who help people fear less, create more, and bring their creative visions to life. If you are an OG member of the Spark File community, welcome back, Sparkler. If you're joining us for the first time, well, welcome, friend. Welcome. Know that just by listening to this podcast, you are joining a warm and wonderful clan of creatives. Yes, but you may be asking yourself, what exactly is a Spark File? A Spark File is a place where you consistently collect all your inspirations and fascinations. If you're like us and you're making stuff all the time, or you want to be making stuff all the time, you know if you're not careful your campfire of creativity can flicker out but don't despair we're collecting kindling in the form of fresh ideas images and inspiration that spark creativity and peak curiosity to light a fire under our collective asses Woo! to make things Woo! like this podcast or a creative way to ensure that people get the reproductive care they need Ooh! every episode we're going to reach into our spark files and exchange some sparks and from time to time we're going to talk to some folks who spark us too that means friends we have more sparks than we can possibly use in this lifetime so if something lights you up we encourage you to take that thing and make something of it without further ado laura camion let's open up the, the spark file. I like your witchy, Ooh, your witchy woman. Spark file. How you doing over there, baby K? Yums. I'm doing good. You know, I just, I feel, I just got, I have nothing to complain about. I feel that life is good. That's that's good. Yeah, things good. I'm grateful in the lifehood. Well, Cam's, I've got a big spark for you today. So I I'm feel like ready. I should dig right into okay, it. Okay. Okay. I'm ready for it. I'm excited. I will tell you, I, I just, I have a few preambles on this spark. Okay. This spark is so vast that it could have gone in so many different directions. And I had, there's things that I will brush that are giant sparks that could be standalone episodes of this podcast, but in order to right size it for this, I just, uh, so there's lots of stuff we're not going to cover. Yeah, I hear that. It's tough sometimes when you're like, we could have a whole podcast season yeah. yep. or multiple seasons yep. about just yeah. one part of it. I hear it. Okay. I think I'm really feeling it because this also feels super important. Yes. It feels yes. important to me. And yeah. so I, I want to honor it. And at the same time, I cannot cover it all within a yeah. single spark. So I'll, I'm going to do my we'll best. Do our best. And just take a little... We're a little piece of the spark pie. And maybe just spark us enough to 
go do our own homework. Yeah. And yeah. research more. Listen, right. I'm not here to spoon feed you. You have to do some work too. <laughs> so uh, we're going to get into it today, listeners. And mm. I want you to know mm. you should do what you need to do to take care of yourself. Mm. Listen to that content warning at the top mm -hmm. of each episode, but especially today. I also want to be clear that we are not lawyers. We are not medical practitioners. And what we discuss today should not be construed as legal or medical advice. What is this spark? Wow. So uh, I just want just to Just in case anyone's <laughs> confusing us with medical doctors. Well, listen, listen, we're getting, we're getting into it. <laughs> and I just want to start off just right from the jump. I want to begin by telling you all, hi, sparklers. Some of you were meeting for the first time. It's nice to meet you. Hi, welcome. Uh, about 25 years ago, I had an abortion. I had, wow. yeah, let's get into it. I had, you went for it. Yeah, I'm going for it. It was a safe, healthy abortion. And I had an abortion because I got pregnant and I didn't want to be pregnant. That's reason enough. There you go. I was in a good relationship and I did discuss it with my partner, but I will be clear with you that the choice was mine and I made it. And then once I made that choice, I made an appointment at a clinic. And within two weeks of becoming pregnant, I terminated that pregnancy. Wow. And let me tell you this, and I mean this from the bottom of my bottom. There was no drama. There was no trauma. I personally do not believe that what I did was a sin. So I experienced zero guilt and there was no moral dilemma. I was awake for the procedure with a local anesthesia, which is a little bit unusual, but I, I hadn't registered the fact that you weren't supposed to eat oh. before. And so I had like a light breakfast and I got there and like, they were like, have you had anything to eat? And I was like, yeah, I had some strawberries. And they were like, uh -huh. oh, we're going local. <laughs> You're on the local train. So I was awake oh. for all of it. So I was, I heard it all. I talked with my, you know, talked with the doctor and the nurses throughout uh -huh. it. And wow. it was very brief. And I, while I was super crampy the day of the procedure, which was on a Saturday, I was like back on my feet by Monday in the mix. And I have to tell you, I am so grateful that I lived in a time and a place where all of that was available to me. And what a privilege for like 27 different reasons. Oh my God. Yeah. Susan, first of all, thank you for sharing that story sure. with all of us. Sure. And I just feel really grateful that you were able to get a safe and clean and affordable uh, the healthcare that you needed, yeah. that you got to make the decision that you were with a partner who was, um, understanding of that, that there was no drama. Yep. Um, I mean, no fear. There was yeah. no fear. Yeah. I had no fear. Wow. Which is, yeah. What a privilege, right? So what a privilege, but I've got to tell you, Laura Camion, with the overturning of Roe versus Wade back in June of 2022, mm -hmm. there are many people in the United States who do not have access to this type of health care. That's right. And I really do believe abortion is simply health care. Word. So when Roe was overturned, I became, oh my God, upset, angry, fearful, discouraged. And I'm sure I wasn't alone. No, you were not. And those fears and feelings were not unfounded. According to a New Yorker article, great article by Stefania Taladrid, since late June, when the Supreme Court overturned Roe v. Wade, Texas and 13 other states effectively banned abortion, and more were sure to follow. In some of the states, laws that originated as far back as the 19th century, you know when that was, Laura Camion? The 1800s. Laws as far back as the 1800s were restored. <sighs> Providing the tools for an abortion in Texas has become a felony that could lead you to years in prison and a fellow citizen could sue and collect upwards of $10,000 for every abortion prosecuted. So Stephania Taladrid is focused on Texas in that passage for reasons I'll explain in a moment. But as we know, this is much more widespread. More and more U.S. states are introducing laws that severely restrict abortions. Mississippi, Ohio, Georgia have already passed bills banning abortions once a fetal heartbeat has been detected. Alabama became the first state in decades to make abortion a crime in almost every case, and doctors who perform an abortion could face 
99 years in prison. Ugh. This is a serious time that not only people will be deprived of access to safe reproductive health care, but you could be prosecuted and incarcerated and fined if you seek an abortion, have an abortion, provide an abortion, or abet an abortion. And in some states, your fellow citizens are incentivized to turn you in. That is, that's unfucking believable to me. It's batshit. So all of this was getting very overwhelmingly scary. And then I bumped into stories about people, mostly women from the past and the present who are using their creativity to provide <gasps> safe abortions. Oh. So that's my spark for today, friends, creativity and abortion rights activism. And if you ever wondered what it sounds like when Susan gets angry, this is what it sounds like. Oh, 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 this is no. what her voice sounds like when she's angry. You're going to hear it today. So the first story that I bumped into was on a podcast called Science Versus. Mm -hmm. And this episode is called Science Versus the Abortion Underground. And the story was reported by a journalist named Wendy Zuckerman. Wendy told the story of a woman named Carol Downer, who is now in her 80s. But back in the 60s, Carol was in this rocky marriage had four kids already, and then she found out she was pregnant again. Mm. And she wanted to get an abortion, but it was illegal at the time. So she had to resort to seeing this shady abortion provider who provided her with an abortion that was very painful. Mm. And that experience was a real turning point for Carol Downer. Oof. So a couple years later, after remarrying, Carol discovered the feminist movement. She was sort of like, wait, what's that meeting? What's happening? And she went and she attended this meeting and it's like her world changed. Mm -hmm. And as an extension of that, she began observing a doctor who was providing safe, illegal abortions to women during that time and slowly it almost was like she was um first an observer uh-huh <laughs> she was an intern and she and then she started to learn how to provide safe abortions wow and then she started doing a few abortions wow. herself and she wanted to recruit other women to do them too so in the early 70s, she placed a sort of a vague ad in a local feminist newspaper in California, and she invited women to come to this local bookstore in Los Angeles for a meeting on women's issues. Oh. And about 30 women showed up, and Carol starts describing to them how safe abortions work and how she is interested in finding a way to provide safe abortions to other women. And Carol said the women were aghast. They were upset. Like you could hear a pin drop white as a sheet. Now you have to remember abortion was illegal at the time. And these right. women probably associated abortion with sort of shady, dangerous back alley situations. Right. Right. So if that's your only reference for abortion, I think it could, it might be hard to imagine that abortion could be safe and it could be easy. Right. And also they had never lived in a time when it was not illegal. Correct. So Carol gets this idea spontaneously at this meeting. You have to hear her voice. She, this is the voice. The voice telling the story is this very, it's this like very sweet, but strong 80 year old woman. Mm. So Carol in the seventies gets this idea in the middle of this meeting. And she said, even though she was absolutely petrified, she was going to show them the female anatomy. And so she jumps up on this desk in this bookstore. <gasps> she lays back, pulls up her dress, pulls down her panties, inserts a speculum into her own vagina <gasps> and shows these women who are gathered something that most of them had never seen before, the inner workings of the female reproductive system. They must have flipped out. I have to tell you the way Carol describes it in this interview on Science Versus, she was so scared and she said it was a risk that she, she didn't know how the women would react. Like, would they think that she yeah. was just some sort of um, exhibitionist? And, but what happened was in an instant, she demystified all of it for the women who were gathered. Wow. She showed some of these people for the first time what the inside of 
you know, a version of what their own female bodies look like. It's a revolutionary act to do like to do something like that. Yeah. When, you know, women are living through a time where like they have not seen photographs of other yes. women's bodies. That's right. They have, you know, not been encouraged to take a mirror and look at their own body. Yes. Okay. So yes. So in this podcast, Science Versus, they explain that academic articles that are written about that time talk about how so few women had looked at their bodies and how many felt uncomfortable asking simple questions of their gynecologist. One researcher wrote that doctors could be condescending and patronizing. And in Carol's experience, she recounted that if you asked a gynecologist a question, he would just say, don't worry about it, dear. I'm the doctor and I'll do what's best for you. Yeah. Also keeping in mind that uh, probably close to 100% of the doctors, the gynecologists were male. They didn't even have these body parts. That's right. It was a whole different time. <laughs> Sometimes not so different, but it was a different time. So back at the bookstore, by jumping up onto that desk and pulling down her underwear and putting in a speculum and showing these women the inside of her reproductive organs, Carol demystified it. Mm -hmm. The women saw that it was normal and okay to be curious about your body. Oh my God. And seeing how powerful this was, Carol began formulating a new plan, not only to teach women about abortions, but also to teach women about their bodies. So Carol Downer created a movement called the self helpers. Wow. And she and a friend packed a box full of speculums and traveled to more than 20 cities to introduce <gasps> women to something that they had been sitting on their whole lives, but many of them had never seen the female reproductive system. And they point this out in the podcast, their boyfriends and husbands and doctors may have seen it, but now these women were seeing it themselves for the first time. Wow. Which I just, uh, I, I'm, I'm delighted by it. I'm like shocked by it. I'm just um, empathetically thinking about how shocking it would have been for them to do that for the first time. Oh, Laura, if you, if we were gathered, if there was a group of women in my living room and somebody, and I love and trust all you, my lady friends, but if somebody was like, <laughs> I'm going to get up on this table, insert a speculum, and I want you to see what's going on up there. Just, I want you to see clinically what is going on up there. We'd be talking about it for years later. Years. Wow. And we live now, you know, decades later. Now. Yeah. So people who attended these meetings in turn hosted their own meetings. And one of the attendees is interviewed and says, we were just levitating and we all bought our little speculum uh, for $1.50 and we took them uh, home and then we showed all of our friends. So it was just like that Fabergé oh shampoo commercial. Gosh. They told two friends and they told two friends and so on and so on and so on. So through her boots on the ground work, Carol was just making this knowledge viral. And then months after Carol showed off her cervix in the bookstore, she and some others started a women's health clinic in Los Angeles, and they taught women everything they knew about vaginas, and they learned how to do pap smears from a physician who worked at the CDC, as well as learning how to fit diaphragms and conduct pelvic exams. And throughout all of it, as they were treating women, they'd explain exactly what they were doing, and they would encourage questions. And it was a very different approach that educated and empowered women. Now, flash forward to when I had my abortion, they, they were talking to me because I wasn't under anesthesia. They were like, now you're going to feel a little pinprick in your cervix. And that's just us injecting some anesthesia into your cervix. And now you're going to hear the sound of suction. And I was like, wow. All right, yeah, talk me through it. Talk me through it. So that's what they were doing. And for some mm -hmm. of their, their uh, patients, it was probably the first time that they were being exposed to this approach that was more educational and empowering for them. Uh-huh. Yeah. Wow. So these clinics mushroomed with at least 50 self-help groups popping up all across the country. And then some of the self-helpers 
learned how to provide safe abortions. Wow. And the journalist interviewing Carol, now again, did I mention she's in her 80s, asks about the fact that people on Carol's team were conducting abortions without credentialed medical training. Mm -hmm. And Carol responds sure. that the work that they were doing was very easy to defend because essentially at the time, unless you were rich and could afford the expense of traveling to a doctor who would provide you with a safe abortion, even though it was still illegal. That's right. Uh -huh. But if you have money, as we know in this country. Oh, yeah. I mean, just to take a tiny tangent, like when when Roe v. Wade was being overturned, I was like, oh, these politicians, You, I mean, we all saw the posters and the memes. These politicians who are codifying this and putting it into law, if their wife or daughter or mistress gets pregnant, and they want an abortion, they're going to find an abortion. They will find a way. That's right. That's right. They That's will, right. It will happen. So Carol was saying that unless you were rich and could afford the expense of traveling to a doctor who would provide you with a safe abortion, then back alley abortions were the alternative. And there were very serious, horrible things that were happening as a result. And Suze, can I just stop you for a second? Sure. At this time, like there was no talk even about legalizing abortion, right? But we're still not to the point where people have started to fight for that legislation. We weren't far. We weren't far. Okay. We were, we were getting, we were getting real close okay. and we're going to bump into it in just okay. a second. Okay, great. So, you know, the self-helpers are setting up, in addition to the other care that they're providing and education that they're providing, now they're doing some abortions and doing abortions is still very illegal. And soon the police started surveilling and then they raided the self-helpers <gasps> LA clinic oh, and Carol no. and another self-helper were charged with practicing medicine without a license. Oh no. And Carol decided to fight. And when the case went to trial, Carol remembers driving herself to the court and the song, I am woman, hear me roar came wow. onto the radio. If you're listening to this and you don't know that song, it's a Helen Reddy song. Stop what you're doing. And <laughs> stop what you're doing and Google it. And you have to know that that was an important song for people. It's not the only song of protest, obviously, but it was an important song of protest at the time. And Carol is driving herself to the courthouse, singing along at the top of her lungs. And she said she felt great. She felt prepared to stand trial. And she said these words on this uh, Science Versus podcast. I realized that I wasn't facing anything worse than I had been facing my whole life but it always had been in this nebulous way, ways you couldn't really address. So now my oppressor had shown his face and I could actually engage with him and fight. And that was a wonderful feeling. Wow. That trial lasted for five days. And because I think they had insufficient evidence, Carol Downer was found not guilty. And then just weeks later, the case of Roe v. Wade was decided effectively legalizing abortions <gasps> in the United States. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, yep. So, hooray. But then cut to June of 2022 when Roe was overturned. Boom. Oof. Yeah. It's a big oof. It's so, yeah, it's infuriating. I, I, yeah, it's it's really, really, really enraging. Just did not believe that it would happen that, you know, in our lifetime that we could have made this progress and then lost this progress. But this is why when Amy Coney Barrett was confirmed to the Supreme Court, there were people that could see a few moves down the chessboard and they were, you know, grieving because we knew where this was headed, but we're still fighting yes. and we're still looking for uh, inspiration. And uh, speaking of fighting and inspiration, mm -hmm. there are so many people fighting for reproductive rights on several fronts. You have people fighting legally, you have people fighting politically. I want to spotlight one activist who I am finding super sparky. Like when I get scared, I think of this person and I'm just like, fuck around and find out. And that person is named Veronica Cruz. According to our friend Wikipedia, Veronica Cruz is the founder of Las Libras, which means depending on the translation you're relying upon, the free ones. And you know, that speaks to me, the free ones. This is an organization based in Mexico dedicated to the defense, guarantee, and respect of human rights, 
for women in the state of Guanajuato and across Mexico, Veronica Cruz has worked to decriminalize and destigmatize women's decisions over their bodies and reproductive rights. She works to bring public awareness to the situations of predominantly uneducated, indigenous, and impoverished women who are imprisoned for abortion and miscarriage in Mexico. Oh. And by all accounts, she is a bad ass. So there is this great article in the New Yorker by journalist Stephania Taladrid, who I just mentioned. Yeah. And in it, she tells the story about how five years ago, Veronica Cruz was defying Mexican law by helping women, again, mostly poor women, abort at home. In part because activists like Cruz successfully reduced the stigma of abortion, the Supreme Court of Mexico decriminalized abortion in September of 2021. In the same month, Texas moved in the opposite direction, and this state law known as SB8 banned nearly all abortions past the sixth week. So then, Veronica Cruz had widened the scope of her work, supplying free abortion pills to undocumented women in Texas. Whoa. And now she has organized a multi-generational network of activists who are getting abortion pills across the Mexican border to Americans, all sorts of people who need them. Wow. And apparently <laughs> this is this. Oh, my God. You have to. Oh, this journalism is so good. Stephania Taladrid is also so sparky because as I was listening to the story, and it is a big piece of journalism, I was like, man, there are some brave, sparkish women who are a part of all of this. So yes, apparently there's this whole army of older female expats living in Mexico and they are referred to as the old hippies. <laughs> Locally, they are called the old hippies in English, the old hippies. So among those expats is a woman named Liz. That's not a real name. Everybody uses pseudonyms because, you know, they're doing the good yes. work. So yes. Liz is a retired Southern woman in her 70s. And on the morning of June 24th, 2022, as she was making coffee in her kitchen, where, you know, she's got pictures of her great-grandchildren covering the fridge. She heard on the radio that the constitutional right to abortion in the United States has ended. And she sits down. <laughs> like, she, oh. it makes her sit down. But five years earlier, Liz had met Veronica Cruz. Oh. So Liz figured that with Roe overturned and states from Arkansas to South Dakota implementing abortion restrictions, the demand for Mexican abortion pills would soar. So she picked up the phone and she called Cruz, and then she called some of her friends, mostly friends over 60, to find out which of them would be game to join an underground network. Uh. Because these women were old enough to remember what life was like before the 1973 Roe ruling. And they fucking fought for it the first time. They fought, they fought for it the first time, and they were like, Lord, I, not to jump my own spark, but what do we make of it? A movie about the old hippies and, Veronica, and a movie, a standalone. My God, who is going to get to play Veronica Cruz? There should be a movie. There should be a series about her. Well, Kate, are you, are you, I know you have a lot of ground to cover, so you may not be going into further detail, but are you going to tell us how, what about this underground network they started? I'm going to tell you right <gasps> now. Yes. And this, this should be a movie. This yes. should be a movie. So okay. in July, weeks after the U.S. Supreme Court negated Roe, this group of old hippie ladies met with Cruz, and Cruz asked them if they would raise money and buy pills in Mexico that could be distributed across the border. So I want to just for a second talk about medication abortion. Uh -huh. This is an abortion brought on by taking medication. What's kind of called the- The morning after pill. The morning after pill. Yeah. yeah. So when I was writing the spark and I was like, I want to tell you loud and proud that I have had an abortion. I was like, I think I've had two abortions because I was like, I think I'm pregnant again. And I, it was literally the morning after because- I'm sure it's different for different women, but I was like, I can feel this in my body. I feel something. There is yeah. a, a gigantic hormone shift in my body. And I was like, chalk me up for two abortions because- Because you took um, a morning after pill. Yeah. And it was so no trauma, no drama that I was like, yeah, I did. Like, it's such a vague memory. And what a privilege. 
Wow. And what a fucking privilege. So, wow. so yes. Yeah, so a medication abortion is an abortion brought on by taking medication. And in the United States, this is typically a two day process that involves taking mifepristone, which blocks progesterone and misoprostol, which causes uterine contractions. So the, the FDA, the food and drug administration approves the use of this two pill regimen under a doctor's supervision up until the 10th week of pregnancy. And a prescription, which can be obtained in the United States where abortion is legal, is required. In Mexico, Cruz explained to these old hippies, misoprostol is sold over the counter. <gasps> Mifepristone still requires a prescription, but Cruz had found suppliers. And when she ran short, she could rely on misopristol, which can cause an abortion on its own. I think ideally you use them in concert with each other. Yeah. But I just want to, in case you didn't know, I just want to demystify this for people. You know what, Laura, as I was doing this, I was like, you know what I'm down with? Destigmatization. Yeah. All hail Carol Downer and other people who are have worked to destigmatize this because what abortion is healthcare. So yep. we have to remember though, in some US states, what I'm describing here, so with such anger yeah. and so cavalierly, it's highly illegal. In Louisiana, anyone who knowingly performs a medication abortion is subject to a five year prison sentence and a $50,000 fine. Where is that? Louisiana, to our friends in Louisiana. To our friends in Oklahoma, it's a 10 year sentence and a $100,000 fine. Oh my God. And it's expected that more laws like this may come. Although, I want to be clear about this, no criminal convictions have been reported. Interesting. It's early days, but no criminal convictions have been reported. Have they gone to court? Not that I'm aware of. Yeah. Okay. Not that I'm aware of. Okay. And there's a whole, this is a whole other spark, but there's there's this whole other spark to puss on this about how it may benefit politicians more to pretend like it's not happening than to actually prosecute. But that's a whole other spark. Why? I'm trying to think of why, how it would benefit them. Just because they got to say I was against it. Yeah. But then it doesn't take time and money in the court systems. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Wow. Okay. So the way Cruz sees it, women have a moral duty to stand up for one another when the state fails to guarantee their rights. And I fucking I love her for I it. Concur. I love it. So in the Americas, one of the privileges of advanced age <clears throat> is getting the benefit of the doubt at security checkpoints. So these old, <gasps> old hippies, so these old hippies started getting these pills across the border out of Mexico into the United States. And there's this one old hippie who is written about and interviewed and she talks about how she goes to this like local artisan's market. She buys like 20 pairs of handmade beaded earrings at the market in Mexico. And then she gets those cardboard jewelry boxes that have the little, um, that little cotton padding that layer. little cotton thing in there. Mm -hmm. And then she puts the earrings on top and then she puts the pills and the instructions about how to use them inside the cotton padding and the instructions that the little note with the instructions ends with hugs the pill fairy. So they, they are also called the pill fairies. Okay. That's amazing. But also is there any chance they could get caught since they are revealing exactly how they do it? Uh -huh. okay. Yeah. Yeah. But I think this is where a lot of this creativity comes in Yeah, because these, uh, these they're going to stay one step ahead. Yeah. Yeah. That's how I'd like this movie to play out. Now so, that we've said that on air, we've got to yeah. change our system. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So this woman who is, has smuggled these over to just, this woman has had two abortions herself and she liked the idea of putting earrings in every package, not just because it's a good sort of discretionary cloak yeah. to get it across the border and it, she can just declare souvenirs. She said, it's so stressful to be pregnant when you don't want to be, you have all these hormones going, you don't like the way your body feels. You just want it to be over. So I thought it'd be nice to get a pair of earrings when you're in that kind of mood, you know, an abortion and a present. 
Oh my God. And I was like, come on. So uh, then, so she, you know, she puts all the, the pills, uh, the necessary pills, the instructions, the little cotton layer, the earrings, and then she packs them into her carry on and heads to the airport. And at customs, she declares some souvenirs and she's welcome back to the United States. And where is she a resident? So she's an expat living in uh, San Miguel Allende. Got it. And also there, this network though, this network is ever expanding. And so the other thing that's really interesting is the way that, because Veronica Cruz is a badass, the way that it's set up it's all segmented. So nobody knows anybody else's identity. Nobody knows anybody else's whereabouts. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And they're all super aware. I don't get deeply into this, but they are all highly cognizant of their digital footprint and their Google searches. And so, you know, they're being smart about it. I just feel so mad that it's come to this. Uh Uh-huh. Did I, may I remind you of the sound of my angry voice? Yeah. I, I have a little bit of, I still have to shake myself because I am disbelieving that it's come to this, but here we are. So like we all, we have to fight this on so many fronts. Wow. We have to fight this by voting. We have Mm -hmm. to fight this by educating ourselves. We have to Mm -hmm. fight this by engaging. I have to tell you after now I can't do it because I've said it on a podcast, but I was like, Oh God, I'm, I like to be a pill fairy. You want to say, how can I help? Yeah. 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 Fuck yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, there's other ways as well. People are, you know, offering, I'm sure you have this in your spark, so I don't want to jump it, but you know, offering to house people who need to come in from other States, et cetera. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. So there's a, just a, another stroke of creativity. Another old hippie is a gardener and she's out working in her garden. And then she's like, Oh, the seeds oh, I'll put the pills and the instructions in a packet of seeds in case maybe the person who receives it might have a little patch of dirt and they could plant flowers. And I was like, you beautiful old hippies. Love them. Cruz has said that she thinks of herself as part of an ant colony of civil disobedience. And I'm going to, this is so much of this is just uh, Stephanie Taladrid's beautiful writing. One of countless workers toiling beneath an unbroken surface, carving intricate paths towards their goal. In the United States, as in Mexico, Cruz predicted the more people who got involved in the movement, the harder it would be for anyone to stop it. So Stephanie Taladrid's article ends with the story of a woman in Texas named Sarah, we'll call her Sarah, Mm -hmm. who discovered she was pregnant. She didn't want to be. And her friends, her supportive friends were texting with her about how to arrange a Texas miscarriage in case they were being surveilled. And she learned about an organization called Plan C. Plan C helps women in the U.S. to obtain abortion medication from around the world. So Sarah placed an order, but it wouldn't arrive for a month. So she took her pregnancy test at 9.30 a.m. in the morning, and through a friend, she got in touch with Veronica Cruz's network via an encrypted text service called Signal. And two hours later, Veronica Cruz's network had the pills she needed in that woman's hands. Wow. So one month later, Sarah's abortion pills from the plan C finally made it to her. And while this woman, Sarah did not know Veronica Cruz or the old hippies or anyone else in this whole constellation of activists, the only person that she knew and had contact with was this stranger who had handed her the pills. Oh my gosh. But she imagined this expanding constellation of women operating in secret and in concert to help other women. And Sarah thought, try to arrest all of us. And she grabbed her phone and she texted the contact who had handed her the pills and said, how do I start doing what you do? Oh, Y'all, Stephanie Taladrid's reporting in The New Yorker is so good. We need to share this article too. I think we'll do that. Yeah. When, yeah. this, when this episode airs. So I want to talk about what do we make of it? There are so many, what do we make of it? There's a whole story that I didn't even tell you that I researched that I didn't even get into about the Jane collective. Mm-hmm. The Jane collective started in 1965 in Chicago. 
very much to serve, you know, women. Yes. Who, is there a TV show about this, The Jane Collective? There's a film. Oh, film. There's a star-studded film starring Elizabeth Banks and yes. Sigourney Weaver. Yes. Called Call Jane. Call and Jane. Also, there's an HBO documentary called The Janes that tells the story of these women and this network they constructed to provide more than 11,000 abortions oh from 1969 through 1973 when legal clinics opened in Chicago. And that story ends very, not spoiler alert, but that story ends very similarly in that they were about to prosecute. They they busted them and they were about to prosecute these women and Roe v. Wade happened. Wow. And that's how, yeah. Talk about a hero's journey. Talk wow. about, yeah. So I also want to point out there's so many ways. There are so many creative ways to engage with this if you are so inclined. Journalism, my God. God, the journalism that's coming out of this. Mm. New York Magazine's The Cut has published a great resource for up-to-date abortion information. And it's at thecut.com slash abortion dash clinic dash near dash you. But if you put the cut.com abortion resources there, mm -hmm. there are so many things, how to protect yourself when seeking an abortion, mm. how to learn about your legal risks. So the good people at the cut.com and New York magazine are doing the work. And when I was preparing this, I was like, we may lose listeners because of this, because I think that we probably do have listeners who believe differently, who believe that mm -hmm. life begins at conception. Mm -hmm. And I was like, huh, what do I, what do I think about that? That we might, and I was like, I prioritize the destigmatization and my belief that abortion is it's healthcare. It's healthcare. It is healthcare. And I also think I would love to believe that people can hang with differing opinions, regardless of your belief can we go back to the fundamentals of what it means to live in a free country? Living in a free country means that you may make a different decision than another person would make. And that's a beautiful thing. I feel the same about guns. I don't want, I want there to be far more uh, legislation around guns, but fundamentally, if someone chooses to have a gun and I choose not to have a gun, that is what it means to live in a free country. I don't love their choice. Do we want to live in a free country? And same thing with abortion. No one is insisting that you have one. But if you have, if you need one and you want one, you should be able to get one. Yeah. I believe so. That is my belief. I also thought, talk about right like your parents are dead. I was just like, I know that my parents are on the other side of this. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. it's a little bit, we agree to disagree. I have family members who have dedicated their lives to the other side of this. Yeah. Same, same. Yeah. Absolutely. 100%. And I, I love them and I respect them and I feel and believe differently. That's right. So that is where it's at. That is right. And hopefully if you're a listener and you have enjoyed us thus far and you've continued listening, if you, you know, strongly disagree, can we agree? Can we agree to disagree about this and um, respect the creative ways that people are trying to get what they need? in a world where our healthcare system is not providing what they need. Yeah. And our judicial system our judicial system. <laughs> and our political system is, is making it wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And it is not an even playing field. No. Something, this is a whole, uh, this is not even an episode. This is huge. Who does this target? Well, who pays the consequence for it? Exactly. Yeah. It's like the, the people who can't, yeah. The injustice runs deep on this one. I also am so emboldened yeah. by the work of these journalists and these activists and the bravery. And I just love, I'm like, if you have the privilege of being an old white lady who looks like you are just, you just. Yes. Suze, you and I can get through an airport. Yeah. Frankly. Maybe not after this podcast, but yeah. And I just think like, thank God for the people who are showing up to say, 
uh, tired of this belief system being shoved down the rest of our throats when over and over again, the majority of Americans have said, we believe that abortion, we should have access to abortions. It is healthcare. And I'm personally inspired by, it's, it's not enough, but I'm inspired by things like, you know, in Kansas where they tried to put it on the ballot. And I think a lot of people thought no brainer, we're going to abolish, you know, any possibility in the future of abortions in Kansas. And the people of Kansas were like, no, you're not. Hard pass. No, you're not. Um, and so I just think like, again, yes, follow the money, follow the politics, who is who benefits from this. And um, we have to just keep rising up. We have to keep reiterating our stance on this. Somebody please make a movie. Somebody get to writing that screenplay about Veronica Cruz. It is. Yes. She is unbelievable. That's a hot spark. That's an it amazing is a story. Hot spark. An incredible role for someone to play. Oh my gosh. She is sort of like when people are like, aren't you scared? You could get arrested. And she's like, then you all have to come and get me out. Like she is she is badass incarnate. She's really, really great. And she has been, God, I found her so sparkish. She has been essentially, she's been an activist since she was a kid. When she was a little kid, she was like, I need to make sure that other little kids have what they need, whether that's food, toys, clothing. As she got older, she was like, in high school, she was like, I need to make sure that these women in my community can read. So she was going to teach wow. them and her work, she became a social worker and her work has evolved as she has been called to these needs wow. in her community. And she is, I don't know. I really, it really helps me to look to people like that because yeah. I think I can be kind of a scaredy and I just look at somebody like that and I'm like, all right, all right. I mean, what I think about is, the fear that I might have to participate in something um, is one level. But then I think about the fear of the person who is facing the consequences oh. of either having to birth a child that they do not want or cannot care for or came out of a traumatic experience. And the fear that they're facing of, of either having to have this child or as incredible as the system is, Think about like you're receiving pills from somewhere with some notes about how to take them. That's scary. But I want to say this on that point, the plan C, plan C, because the FDA can't, is not in a position to do it. Plan C has done independent research where they receive, they got pills from all the different, they're sort of like, they are a website that organizes different sources for abortion medication. Mm -hmm. And they got samples from all these different people. They had them tested in the lab and all of them were real. Oh, amen. Yeah. Oh, that's so there's that. So there's that. But I also want to say this, there is a very, very slight chance and you have to take it when it's meant to be taken with a medication abortion. There's a very, very, very tiny slight chance. Again, I'm not a doctor of hemorrhaging or infection with a medication abortion, mm -hmm. but it is largely considered to be, it is recognized to be incredibly safe. Uh, 100%. But I'm just thinking about the fear. Like, yes. If you do yes. hemorrhage, you've got to go into a hospital. Are they're going to ask you what happened here? And if you live in the wrong, if you if you live in the wrong state, you have to say, you you cannot acknowledge that you took pills. That's right. Yeah. And they're going to be able to test and see that you do have that that medication in your blood system. So it's like the fear on top of fear on top of fear. It yeah. takes a whole lot of courage. Fuck that shit. And yeah, fuck this shit that that a woman would be put through that just to get the health care she needs. Because what? Abortion is health care. Friends, yeah. thanks for hanging oh, in. Suze, I feel like you stirred up some dust. I feel like there is a lot of research to be done. There's action to be taken. It's so inspiring. Here's what I want to say to, I know that these are 
<laughs> that is Mr. Toad's Wild Ride has been for a few years now in a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. Lean in when you can take a break when you have to, but when you can, when you can lean in. And if you're in a position of privilege, like these two old white ladies, like, like make the most of it, make the most of Absolutely. your privileges and your platforms. I feel like the, like the younger generation did us good at the voting booth most recently, but they're not going to stand by for this. But these wise old ladies who've been around the block and done this before, I love the, I love the intergenerational work being done together because it takes these older ladies they're not in in risk of getting pregnant right so it's not for them that they're doing it they're doing it for all the other ladies in the world yeah, yeah. Uh, according to the reporting in the new yorker that that network as of the writing of that article is between people in their 30s up to i think 82. yes yeah those yes. Oct octogenarians yes baby. nobody's going through their carry-on so friends yes. that thank you susan thank you laura cami and thank you sparklers thank you sparklers Woo! that's it this episode of the spark file was made on the lands of the lenape people and as always we hope that this put another bunch of sparks in your file listen to me you listen and listen good if there's a spark you'd like us to explore or if you'd like to learn more about how to coach with us to bring your creative ideas to life email us at thesparkfile at gmail.com or submit it through our website, thesparkfile.com. We will even happily take your feedback. But first, the price of admission, you have to share a creative risk you've taken recently. Follow us on social at The Spark File and be sure to subscribe, rate, and five-star review this podcast. It really does help other listeners to find us. Also, if you like this podcast, we hope that you'll share it with people that you love. And if you didn't like it, we wish you the best. Live and be well. It's a free country. Yeah. If something lights you up and gets your creative sparks flying, we're writing you a forever permission slip to make that thing that's been knocking at your door. It's your turn to take that spark and fan it into a flame. You know you got to take it and, and make, make it. it. Oh, Sus, that was so good. When I bump into something that inspires me, I dump it in my spark file. Could be something that I want to make or how I want to be. I pump it in my spark file. I jump into my spark file. Let's open up the spark file. Hi friends, Susan Blackwell from The Spark File here to let you know that the doors are open for The Spark File Illume, a nine-month group creativity coaching mastermind that invites you to be the chief creative officer and chief marketing officer of your creativity. But what does that mean? That means in nine months in Illume, you will clarify and advance your big creative goals and learn how to effectively share your work with the world. Now, if you're listening to this and you're an experienced creative or an accomplished professional who seeks a space where it is safe to attempt something you've never tried before or complete a big creative project or take your work to the next level and acquire the skills needed to share your creative work with the world, Illume might be right for you. We are calling in emotionally intelligent, high-functioning creatives who are ready to level up. You can find out more by going to thesparkfile.com slash Illume, but do it now to find out if Illume is right for you and to save with early bird discounts. That's thesparkfile.com slash Illume. Take a leap, take a risk. Go to thesparkfile.com slash Illume and join us for Illume. Illume.